This is based on the Sanskrit word tat, which is etymologically the root of our word that. And it's supposed in India, you see, that this is the first word that a baby says. We all know babies say da, da, da. And in our highly paternalistic culture, it's assumed that the baby is addressing its father. And so dada means father. But in India, which is uh, where the cultures anciently were matriarchal, it didn't even mean mother, but da, which was the fundamental word of all words. It is the baby pointing to it and saying that. Because when the baby wakes up and is the, as I said last night, an aperture through which the all looks at everything, the great and proper exclamation is when it sees it is to say da. And so tathata is da da da. And it means just exactly that, in the same way as there was a dada school of painting in the West, because they wanted to go beyond words and names, because a dada would argue, when you call a dog a dog, it uh, doesn't sound anything like a dog sounds. Or chien in French sounds nothing like a dog. But if you called a dog, wuff, wuff, that would be a proper name for a dog. So, uh, this is a fundamental word. And we have great difficulty in translating it because in a way it's a meaningless word. Now then, in order to understand this subject properly, I must uh, not take too much for granted. I have to give you some introduction to Buddhism, because this is all part of Buddhist philosophy, and Buddhism finds its context in the philosophy of India. And we have to go, first of all, very thoroughly into what Buddhism is about. And the first thing I want you to understand about Buddhism, that very few people do understand, is that Buddhism does not have a doctrine in the same sense that Christianity has a doctrine. There could be no such thing as a Buddhist creed. The word dharma, d-h-a-r-m-a in Sanskrit, which describes what Buddhism is, Buddhism is called the Buddha dharma. Dharma means method, not doctrine, not law. It's often translated law. That won't do at all. Dharma sometimes means function. The function of somebody. His dharma means roughly what we would call his vocation. Dharma can also mean, in a peculiar way, a thing. A basic portion of the world. A thing or event. But its primary meaning, as used in the phrase Buddha dharma, is method. And so Buddhism is a method for something or other. And so for this reason, all Buddhism is a dialectic, a discussion, an interchange between a preceptor or guru or teacher and his student, between the Buddha and his disciples. Now, what is it about? First of all, the word Buddha comes from a Sanskrit root, Bud, B-U-D-H. And Bud means to be awake. So a Buddha is a person who is awake. It is therefore a title, it's not a proper name, and it's not the name of a divinity. There are many, many gods recognized, angels we might rather call them, in Buddhism, but they are regarded as being inferior to a Buddha. The gods are not yet fully awakened. Buddhism divides the world into six divisions. And uh, this is very important for understanding what's it about. You don't have to take these six divisions literally because they may equally well refer to states of human consciousness. But the six divisions are like this. You see, you draw the circle of the wheel of life.
and in the top section of the circle you have the deva world and deva from which we get our word devil actually means the angels <laughs> in uh, the the reason is this that when the the iranians had battles with the aryans the the northern indians the northern indians called their gods deva so the persians insulted them by using that word for devils and then they had here asura who were in this division and these are spirits of wrath and so opposite ahura in persian ahura mazda is the lord of light because they were enemies but so here are the devas on top and next to them on this side are the the powers of divine uh wrath in the sense of energy vigor and below opposite the devas are the naraka and those are the purgatories that's where everybody is as unhappy as they can possibly be here are animals in this section here are men and women and here are things called pretas pretas are frustrated spirits with very large stomachs and very small mouths now this is the rat race of existence called samsara in sanskrit samsara the round of birth and death and this is the nadir i mean this is the zenith and this is the nadir this is as high as you can get that's as low as you can get and that's always going to happen to you while you work on the principle of a squirrel cage that is to say so long as you are trying to make progress you will go up but up always implies down so while you are trying to get better and better and better that means that when you get to the best you can only go on to the worst and so you go round and round and round ever chasing the illusion that there is something outside yourself outside your here and now to be attained that will make things better and the thing is to recover from that illusion so a buddha means somebody who has woken up and discovered that running around this thing may be fun and it may be good to run around but if you think you're going to get something out of it you're under illusion because you're forever the donkey with the carrot suspended from his own halter now then it goes on to say that there's only one place one point in this wheel from which you can become a buddha and that's here the devas are too happy to become buddhas or to worry about becoming a buddha the narakas are too miserable the asuras are too angry the animals are too dumb and the pretas too frustrated only in the middle position the position of man which is you could say the equal position the position of sufficient equanimity to begin to think about getting off this rat race only from there you see can you become a buddha so the position of a buddha may be represented either as not on the wheel at all or as right in the middle of it it makes no difference and so he uh, is just as in a way the axle point the still point of the turning world as to use ts elliot's phrase uh, is the unmoved center the unmoved mover the primum mobile the axle tree of the world all sort the navel that's why yogis are said to contemplate their navel the navel isn't on their tummy it's this place the navel of the world so that's the scheme of cosmology of ancient indian cosmology in which buddhism arises so you see therefore a buddha is one who awakens from the illusion of samsara that is from the thought that there is something to get out of life that tomorrow will bring it to you that in the course of time it will be all right and therefore one is set pursuing time as if you were trying to quench your thirst by drinking salt water now uh, i can exemplify this a little more strongly by relating 
Buddhism to the social system in which it arose. A Buddhist uh, monk is sometimes called a shramana. S-R-A-M-A-N-A, shramana. This is closely allied to the word shaman. And a shaman is the holy man in a culture that is still hunting. It isn't settled, it isn't agrarian. There is a very strong and important difference between a shaman and a priest. A priest receives his ordination from his superiors. He receives something from a tradition which is handed down. A shaman doesn't. He receives his enlightenment by going off into the forest by himself to be completely alone. A shaman is a man, in other words, who has undergone solitariness. He's gone away into the forest to find out who he really is because it's very difficult to find that out while you're with other people. And the reason is that other people are busy all the time telling you who you are in many, many ways. By the laws they impose on you, by the behavior ruts they set on you, by the things they tell you, by the fact that they always call you by your name, and by the fact that when you live among people you have to be in a state of ceaseless chatter. But if you want to find out who you are before your father and mother conceived you, who you really are, you almost have to go off by yourself. And go into the forest and stop talking, even stop thinking words, and be absolutely alone, and listen to the great silences. And then, if you're lucky, you recover from the illusion that you're just little me, the so-and-so, and you attain the state of nirvana, which means the blown-out state, the relieved state, the sigh of relief. Nirvana may be translated into English as, phew, I've at last discovered that I don't have to survive. I can survive, of course, but I don't really have to. Because you discover, you see, that what you really are doesn't have to survive because it's what there is. The real you is it or that. Tat tvam asi. That art thou, as the Hindus say. So then, in the normal life of India, which is not a hunting culture, but a settled culture. There are priests, but there is something beyond the priest. That is to say, when a man or woman has fulfilled his or her life in the world of society, it's the normal thing to do for a person to quit their status in society and become what's called a forest dweller. That is almost, you see, to go back to the hunting culture. They divide people into two classes, Grihasta, which means householder, and Vanaprastha, which means forest dweller. And the older people all hand over their occupations and positions to their children and enter the stage of Vanaprastha, or become a shramana and go outside the stockade. I'm speaking metaphorically. They sometimes do, actually. They sometimes don't. And become a nobody. They give up their name. That is to say, the label which designates who they are in terms of caste or class. They become unclassified people. That's why, strictly speaking, you see, Hinduism and Buddhism are not religions. 
you can classify the religions. You can say, what's your denomination? Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Quaker, etc., 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 you see. But strictly speaking, a vanaprastha, a shramana, has no label. He is an unlabeled bottle. So, in uh, the time when the Buddha lived, about 600 BC, the Hindu system had become somewhat uh, decadent. It isn't altogether clear what had happened to it, but it is certain that it did seem in some way to be in need of reform. And so, there, there were many reasons for this. And the Buddha, as a young man, being basically troubled by the great problems that we're all troubled with, the problem of suffering, and the problem of what all this universe is about, he endeavored to follow the methods that were then being used by people who were shramanas or vanaprastas, forest dwellers. And at that time, it's very apparent that the main method that these people were using was an ascetic discipline. Starvation, uh, very arduous meditation practices, uh, probably self-flagellation and things of that kind. And it's said that for seven years he practiced these austerities. But he found out that they didn't lead to liberation. And all the people who were practicing them knew they didn't either. But they felt that that was only because they weren't doing it hard enough. And so he propounded instead the middle way. The way uh, that led to liberation from the rat race that I've drawn here, neither through austerities nor through uh, pleasure-seeking. See, these are the two ways, the two paths. The people who say uh, the, the whole point of life is to enjoy it, to get the most out of it, you see. And the other people who tried that, and then they found it was sour grapes or something, you know, or they burned their fingers in the pursuit of pleasure. The girl that was so beautiful eventually fell apart or just turned into a shrew, and uh, whatever it was. And uh, so they said, instead, let us torment ourselves. A lot of people enjoy this, or get something special out of it. I was in Mexico this summer, and what I went there for was to study Mexican Catholicism, where they make a great cult of suffering. And I was very puzzled about this, and wanted to understand it. And everywhere, you know, they have these ghastly... Uh, tormented Christs, all drooling with blood, hanging on crosses in very contorted positions. And I realized there are certain people who find that the sitting on the tip of a spike is the realest place in the world. Because when you're on the tip of a spike, you know you're there. There's no doubt about it. And also you know that you're expiating for everything. This, uh, somehow by sitting on the, on the spike, you are paying for your guilt. And so long as you hurt, you're all right. See? So these shramanas were doing something of the same kind. And the Buddha became enlightened. Became a Buddha. He woke up. At the moment when he gave up that kind of quest. The moment he gave up, as we should say, trying to take the kingdom of heaven by storm. Now, what does this mean? It means that in his time, the way of liberation had become competitive, which meant it was on the wrong track. There are a lot of people who we, we call it the holier-than-thou attitude. But we find it today with some objectionable Westerners who go over to Japan to study Zen Buddhism and then come home and brag about the great disciplines they've undergone. 
and say, I sat with my legs crossed in one position for ten hours as distinct from somebody else who only sat for five. And always there's this tendency, you know, to have a marathon and be in a competition with others or with oneself about these things. <coughs> but the moment you do that, you're back on the wheel. The best thing you can get by asceticism is to get up to the deva world. You can't get anywhere else by it. You may get down to the Naraka world by asceticism too. Read the story Thais by Anatole France. So, he found, you see, that the, the real path, the middle way, the meaning of the middle way is that it's the path that can't be followed. Because to get you onto the middle way, I have to get into a dialogue with you, you see, and you say to me, because after all it's always the student that raises the problem, not the teacher, you say, well, now, what's the right thing to do? I say back to you, why are you looking for the right thing to do? And then you have to consider your situation, where you are. And you say, well, I'm looking for the right thing to do because I feel that I'm in the wrong situation. I don't have peace of mind. Why do you want peace of mind? Because my mind is disturbed. Then, in other words, you, as a disturbed mind, are trying to find peace of mind. Your quest for peace of mind is the same thing as having a disturbed mind. Now, if you don't have a disturbed mind, you won't ask for peace of mind. Well, how can I quiet my mind? Why are you asking to quiet your mind? Because it's disturbed. You see where you are? So, in this way, by this dialogue, the, the guru, the teacher, brings a person back to center. So, then this is the point. All Buddhist teaching is a dialogue. Really and truly, the man who goes out and leaves society and becomes a monk is a little bit too much. Buddhism involves this act as a preliminary gesture. But what it comes to in the end, is the position of what's called a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva means somebody who went out of society, or we should say gave up the world in some way, took on the, the, the robe, took on the discipline. He found what he was looking for, but his finding it was absolutely simultaneous with his coming back into society. And he's called a bodhisattva, as distinct from a pratyeka Buddha, which means a private Buddha, one who goes out and doesn't come back. And the bodhisattva is considered as having a superior attainment, superior insight. So, the important thing to remember then is Buddhism is a dialogue. And its teaching is a method, and not a doctrine. Now, the teaching of Buddhism is summed up in what are called the Four Noble Truths. The truth of suffering, the truth about the origin of suffering, the truth about the ceasing of suffering, and the truth about the way to the ceasing of suffering. Dukkha, D-U-H-K-H-A, is the Sanskrit word we translate suffering, discord, frustration, something like that. That's always the problem, you see. And this, because of suffering, is the reason why human beings seek out teachers and saviors. I hurt, and I don't want to hurt. So that's the, the universal problem, you see, that everybody brings. So then the teacher replies to this problem so then the teacher by saying, to this problem. you suffer because you crave things. 
Trishna, T-R-I-S-H-N-A, from which we get our word thirst. Trishna, craving or desire, is the cause of suffering. That's the second truth. Now, the Buddhist analyzes this a bit. He says, uh, the world is dukkha. He says, it's full of frustration. And it's also characterized by impermanence, anitya, and by non-entitiness, anatman. That means that no thing exists independently. Everything is a thing only in relation to everything else. Therefore, there are no separate things, no real selves or souls or egos. And trying to cling to the world, which is necessarily changing, trying to have a separate self and to protect it, all these things are Trishna. They are the cause of Dukkha. So, the teacher, having said this, then the student comes back and says, well, how do I get rid of Trishna? If Trishna, desire, is the cause of suffering, couldn't I get rid of desire so as not to suffer? And the teacher says, well, you try. And this then is the first part of the discipline, to try not to desire, to calm your mind, to practice centering, to practice getting rid of all what they call klesha, K-L-E-S-A, uh, disturbing thoughts, distractions, evil passions, uh, immoderate appetites, and come to upeksha or equanimity of mind. And so the student practices that. And this is a very difficult and arduous discipline. And all the time he sees the teacher watching him with a slightly sour expression on his face. And he knows, of course, or thinks he knows, that the teacher is fully aware of his inmost thoughts. Because, you know, it's the Indian way. They go to meeting with the teacher, and the teacher sits under a tree and smokes a cigarette or a pipe or something, and all the students sit around cross-legged, and they, they meditate. And sometimes the teacher meditates. And they can see him occasionally looking at them like this, you know. And they think, uh-oh, teacher knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> because he has the power of infinite vision, you see, and all seeingness. And this bugs them completely. Because, you see, you remember how it was in school when you were trying to do something and the teacher walked around and looked over your shoulder? It puts you off completely. And so the Hindu teacher or the Buddhist teacher deliberately puts his students off. And finally, he raises in their minds an insoluble problem that if you are trying to stop desire so that you will not suffer, aren't you still desiring to stop desire? Or the students may very well find that out for themselves. And they say to the teacher, but how are we to stop desire when we are desiring to stop desire? So then the teacher can engage them in an extremely uh, marvelous trap, which is to say, He can, he can play it in a number of different directions. One direction is to say, well, don't try to stop all desire, but try to stop as much desire as you can stop. You see where this is going to go. Then they're going to say, well, uh, I'm a little excessive about desiring to stop desire. Well, if you're naturally excessive about it, he says, try to be as, as slightly excessive as you can. You see? How do you see what's leading here? If you follow that course, you are being brought to center in the same way as I demonstrated before. You're being brought to yourself to accept yourself as you are here and now, totally. But you can't do that directly. 
because if you try to accept yourself, you will always find that in yourself there is a spirit of the non-acceptance of things, and you have to accept that. So the teacher would say, don't try to accept yourself more than you can accept yourself. Accept yourself as much as you can accept yourself. Because then, you see, you are also accepting the part of you that doesn't accept. Or he may try on another tack. He may say, all right, now, if you've seen that it's that desiring not to desire is simply another form of desire, you, you, you're trying, for example, uh, to get rid of your sensuous appetites. You are going to give up booze and women and uh, uh, pate de foie gras or whatever it may be. And uh, you then think, well, now, yes, this I must do. And eventually you find that you are becoming proud of your success in mastering your appetites. And you're beginning to depend on that. So the teacher says, do you see you're in the same trap as you always were? Formerly you sought spiritual security in booze and women and so on. Now you're seeking it in holiness. Formerly you bound yourself with chains of iron. Now you're bound with chains of gold. Formerly you boasted to all the boys how many sins you committed. Now you're boasting before the Lord of how many virtues you have. Same trap. Why do you do it? So the student eventually finds there's no way at all to not desire. Even desiring not to desire is desiring. Even trying to accept oneself is a way of trying to escape from oneself because one hopes psychotherapeutically that by accepting yourself you will get rid of your nasty symptoms. So you're not accepting them. You're not accepting them by the gimmick, by the pretense of trying to accept them. So this is the way in which the dialogue of Buddhism begins to work. And as it progresses step by step, let me try and show you a little bit more how it works, because I'm shortening it enormously in order to give you an outline of the whole thing. What is going on between the teacher and the student, the Buddha and his disciples, is not merely a dialogue. There is the, the verbal dialogue, yes, that goes on. But there also it spread over a long period of time. And in the intervals, the students are practicing meditations. They are making efforts to control their minds and emotions and practicing those things which are the Buddhist equivalents of yoga. So that in parallel to the intellectual discussion, there is going on a total devotion of one's whole being to a quest, morning, noon, and night. And so you see this works up a very considerable uh, psychic alertness. It makes the student put a very considerable psychic investment in the task. And as he goes on, you see, he becomes more and more frustrated. Because as the trap closes, and he finds that it's impossible to do the right thing because the right thing is always done for the wrong reason. When the wrong man uses the right means, the right means work in the wrong way. You see? 
there is something you could do to attain liberation, or as the Christian would say, union with God, if you could do it. But the Christian would say, by reason of original sin, you can't. Because through original sin, everybody is basically selfish. And you can't be unselfish for a selfish reason. But you have only selfish reasons. So, to him that hath shall be given. But of course he doesn't need it. From him that hath not <coughs> shall be taken away even that which he hath. Poor fellow, what is he to do? So you see, in this way, <clears throat> the teacher closes a trap on the student where he finds himself completely impotent. Not only can he not do anything that will bring about his salvation, he is also unable not to do anything. One might say, uh, you, you must do nothing. You must be completely passive. But you can't do that, because the moment you try to be passive, you're doing something. So you get into the state which they call in Zen Buddhism a mosquito biting an iron bull. Or as we would say in our Western idiom, the state when the irresistible force meets the immovable object. Where something must be done, but simply cannot be done. And in this state of maximum frustration, there is an opportunity to understand the situation. To understand that I, the meaning of the state, I cannot do, I cannot not do. The meaning of this state is that the separate I which you thought yourself to be is an illusion. That's why it cannot do and why it cannot not do. You see, what is our I, our ego? Sometime in the development of man, maybe three, four, five thousand years ago, we developed self-consciousness in a peculiar way. We began to realize that by directed thought we could control our environment. And then it was, you see, that we had a sense of responsibility. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that there was a time when nobody deliberated. They did exactly what they felt like. When you were hungry, you ate. When you were thirsty, you drank. When you were angry, you hit something. When you were happy, you danced. But you never stopped to think what was the right thing to do. You just trusted your intuition, your instincts, your unconscious, or whatever it might be called. Well, that was great, because nobody worried. Nobody had any problems when it was like that. See, a baby is in the same situation today. Now, maybe you were unsuccessful. Maybe the thing you did spontaneously was absolutely the wrong thing, and the tiger ate you up. Well, that was all right, because it really doesn't matter if the tiger eats you up, so long as you weren't spending your previous time worrying about it. See, everybody dies, and if you die clunk like that, that's that. You don't spend all your life before you die worrying about death. You don't spend all your time before you get sick worrying about getting sick. And when you see you move on that level of unpremeditated, spontaneous behavior, that's the golden age. And the reason people look back with nostalgia to the golden age is because that was the time of irresponsibility. But when people began to see that they could provide for the future and that they could look after things and take care and direct everything, immediately anxiety came into the world. See, that was the fall of man. Because then, the moment you start doing that, you begin to think, now, having thought this question through and decided that such and such is the right thing to do, have I thought it over carefully enough? 
Now, that's a real bugaboo of a question. You know, you go out of the house and you wonder, did I turn off the gas stove? I think I did, but on the other hand, I'm not quite sure. Let's go back and see. So having gone about five blocks, you walk back. Yes, you did turn it off. So you go out again. You wonder again. Now, I wonder if I really looked or whether I was so keen on finding out that I did turn it off that some sort of wishful thinking perverted my, my consciousness and whether I hadn't better check that I really did look properly, you see? Well, this way you never get away. You're trapped. So this, you see, is the problem of all uh, self-conscious beings. They are, they feel responsibility, then they feel responsible for being responsible, and responsible for being responsible for being responsible, and there's no end to it. So then in this obscure way, everybody wants to get back to the golden age. But they say, if I just acted as I felt and was completely spontaneous, goodness only knows what would happen. Jesus, you see, said to do that. He did. And everybody reads it in the King James Bible where it means nothing. Take no thought for the morrow. What ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, and wherewithal ye shall be clothed. <coughs> Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. But I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Oh, I mean, it sounds lovely read in church. But what it says... Everybody says, oh, 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 no, that's, that's the Sermon on the Mount, and that's not practical. Uh, nobody can do that. That may be for a few saints, but after all, in our practical life as, uh, as a practicing Christians in the modern world, we can't do that kind of thing. Well, isn't that funny? Why can't you do it? I mean, that's the real reason for saying it in the first place. Jesus said many very strange things. For example, in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, how the Pharisee goes up into the front row and says how good he is and that he's fulfilled all his obligations and paid the tithes. And then there's this, this publican who goes into the back and sits there and beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, now that man was the right man. He was justified. But the moment he's told that story, everybody creeps into the back row and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And they're all in the front row again. <laughs> Nobody can do it, you see. That's why the story is told. In the same way, he says, take no thought for the morrow. Stop being anxious. Like going to a psychiatrist and he says to you, oh, don't worry me, stop being nervous. Can you? See, nobody can. And also they find out, you see, that really in the end, nobody can be God. Nobody can make life any better by being responsible about it. Because whatever you gain in that direction, you lose at the same time. By being responsible, we've created civilization, medicine, care of the poor, everything. But what a headache the thing has become. As we solve all our problems, we make more problems. Every problem you solve gives you ten new problems. I'm not saying don't do that, but don't think you're going to get anywhere by doing that. That's one way of arranging it. That's one kind of dance you can have, is to improve everything and have technology. But it doesn't really solve anything. And it's only in the moment you see when you fully understand that your situation as a human being is completely insoluble, that there is no answer, and that you give up looking for the answer, that's, whew, that's nirvana. And that's how Buddhism works. <laughs>